passage of scripture, please help us to understand it better. We ask you, Phil Pastor, with your spirit, uh, illumine our hearts, help us to receive the truth, and of course we'll praise you for what you do uh, in our hearts and in the days ahead, in Christ's name. Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, if you look at verse number 1, he starts out and says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Now this point is what's called the return of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord, and our gathering together is the rapture. That is where we meet the Lord in the air. And so these events happen at the same time. This is our resurrection. In verse 2 he says, That ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's saying, don't let somebody get you worked up or concerned. Don't let them lie to you and say, it's at hand, it's today. It's kind of like Chicken Little, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. He says, don't get worked up, don't get concerned. So this is important because why? Why is he saying this? Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, that's apostasy, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, that's the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. Now, interesting, he says, this Antichrist will claim to be God, but he's not. He'll sit in a temple. He's calling God's temple, but it is not. And these things will happen before the Lord returns, which is what this clearly teaches. Now, we have been dealing with the pre-tribulation rapture timeline. And I know most of you have a copy of this. If you don't, grab one. Um, it's also... Uh, online as well. And I believe, according to the Bible, that the Antichrist will come and for three and a half years he will persecute the world, but then especially at the fifth seal there will be a great tribulation against Christians and there will be an Antichrist, a mark of the beast, the number of his name, that 666. And so that's the last part of, of his uh, push and then the Lord returns, and there are several things that must happen before the Lord returns. After He returns, He pours out His wrath for three and a half years before the Lord sets up His millennial kingdom. And tonight I want to talk about objections to the pre-wrath rapture. I've had the privilege of speaking with many pastors over many years about this topic, and almost all of them sort of default to the same passages or responses. They have the same hang-up. And a lot of it has to do uh, with uh, what's called dispensational theology, something that was created in the 1800s. One of the first problems that most people have is they're not uh, properly discerning the difference between tribulation and wrath. Now on that chart, it's clearly delineated. If you look up the word tribulation in the Bible, uh, the great majority of it is always speaking about Christians suffering tribulation. The word is almost parallel with affliction or persecution. So that happens from the devil when the devil pours out his wrath on the earth, as Revelation 12, 12 says. We saw that earlier this morning. Um, but then, after the resurrection, God will pour out His wrath, and He will repay those that has given us tribulation. He will pour out this wrath on earthly Jerusalem and on the seat of the beast, on His kingdom, His earthly kingdom. He will clean up the earth and purge it before He sets up His throne. Now, a simple word search would solve the majority of the problem, because almost every pastor or preacher or eschatologist that I've had the opportunity of speaking with on this issue, they often default, what do you mean we're going through the tribulation? God's people are not appointed to wrath. It's almost like saying apples and oranges. And if they were honest with themselves, if they were sincere about believing the Word of God in every Word of God, they would see there is a difference between wrath and tribulation when it comes to the end times timeline. That simple word search would clear up most objections, but there are two other major strongholds that uh, most pre-tribbers hold. Most pre-tribbers can't distinguish between 
wrath and tribulation, right? Or the, the, the war against the saints as we saw this morning, as we looked at the, the fifth seal. But the two issues we're going to talk about tonight, that is the real foundation of the hang-up, the fruit of the dispensational movement, uh, are, are these. And it's eminence and Israel. Eminence and Israel. Now, the doctrine of eminence is that Jesus could come back at any moment. Jesus could return. There is no biblical prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Everything is complete. All we're waiting for is Jesus to come back. Now, those that believe in that, they believe in a secret rapture. They do not believe that every eye will see him as the Bible says. They say, no, that's the second coming. However, the scriptures clearly put both of these things together. In fact, the rapture happens after the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord is the event and our resurrection is the, the bodily response when we're uh, caught up together in the air. So that is their view of eminency. We'll deal with that, how they say there's nothing left to be fulfilled. The next major sign in prophecy that we're looking forward to is that secret rapture where we don't see anything. All of a sudden, a pile of clothes just falls to the ground, you know? And I don't know if you guys have seen the drawings or the movies or the postcards. I remember as a child, I had a postcard I held onto in my Bible for a long time. And it, because it was fast, it was a fascinating picture, but it was a picture of cars going off of bridges and airplanes crashing, and it's like the rapture. The only problem is, there was no Jesus. There was no resurrection. There was no sign whatsoever. So what's the sign? Well, when you see airplanes fall out of the sky and cars go off the road and piles of clothes in the road, you know, then you'll know maybe that that was Jesus that took them away. And it really is a bizarre doctrine. And I, I don't want to uh, mock those that believe it. I'd rather persuade them to prove the scriptures themselves. This is very important. Uh, eminence is a stronghold. We'll deal with that one first. The second is the error of Israel. Not discerning who Israel really is. And this problem it's a teaching that the people that dwell in the land are blessed under the Old Covenant. Here's the problem. The Old Covenant has gone away. Your zip code does not automatically give you a covenant with God. If your zip code happens to be in Palestine or Israel or Jerusalem, aha, I'm God's people. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Right? The problem is they don't understand Israel or the Jews, who they really are, according to the Bible, and they've been deceived by a bunch of Yiddish-speaking Russians. There is a Russian conspiracy in Israel. The majority of the Israelites at the top, they're really Russians, they're Khazaris, Ashkenazis, they speak Yiddish, that which is not the Hebrew of the Bible. They speak a, it's a different Israel with a different God. They have a different Bible, a, a different language. Everything is completely different, but they've attached that label. They call themselves Jews. They say this now is Israel, according to the Balfour Declaration. But none of that is true. In fact, the Bible warns us about fakers. So we'll deal with Israel secondly. Uh, first, we'll deal with the imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ or the immediate without anything holding it back. And I've heard it, even recently I've heard it. Hey, Jesus come back any moment. I'm ready for it. Boy, it could be today. Wouldn't that be great? Amen. You know, and it's kind of like, I mean, it sounds good and it feels good to preach that and believe that. But if it's wrong, do you want to know the truth? Wouldn't you rather know the truth? Now think about this. I've heard an example of somebody, if there was somebody standing outside the door and they were going to punch you in the face, wouldn't you want to know? Right? Uh, most of us men, now Justice, think about it. If I said, Justice, there's a man outside of the door. He's got a baseball bat and a pocket knife. You can use any weapon you want, but when you walk through that door, you better be ready to tangle with him. You got to be ready to defend yourself, okay? You say, okay, well, then I better get ready. Let me think. What, how do I handle a baseball bat? What am I going to do with a pocket knife? Let me, I'm going to, you know, you start gathering things and getting ready and preparing your heart. Okay, I'm going into war. I'm going through that door. I know what to expect. Now, what if I just said, hey, you never know. Somebody's going to punch you one day real soon. What do you mean? I can't tell you. When will it be? Who knows? It could happen even It could happen right now. But I can't tell you when it'll be or where it'll be. Or if you'll be awake or asleep, or you'll be at the store or walking down the road. You could be jogging. Who knows? Then somebody will jump out and punch you. Oh, man, I'm scared. Now what am I going to do? Like, that doesn't help. That doesn't comfort, right? So I tell you these things. The Lord tells us these things because He loves us. He wants us to be prepared that there are things we will expect. And so I want you to know that the Bible, it does not teach 
that the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is without a sign. It does not teach that there is an imminent rapture that could happen immediately at any moment without a sign. In fact, many signs have been given to us so we can discern the signs of the times and prepare our hearts and prepare our lives. Uh, we just read 2 Thessalonians 2. We're going to look at it again here. Uh, but that and also Revelation 6 and Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, they all agree with this fact that there are several signs. If you have that uh, chart, pull it up. It says the Antichrist will be revealed. There will be world war, probably like a World War III. There will be a food famine. There will be a death casualties of 25% of the population will die. You're not going to miss that. You're going to know that. You'll recognize when these things come to pass. And then a great tribulation where there will be an abominable sacrifice in Jerusalem that is so abominable that the overspreading of it, it causes desolation everywhere. And that is in conjunction with the mark of the beast that goes in your hand, in your forehead. You have to worship the devil to get it and you have to have it to buy food or to sell products. We're going to notice those signs. That's pretty clear. But then there's one more sign. There's one more. The sun and the moon and the stars will be darkened. There will be signs in the heavens that are supernatural right before the coming of the Lord. So that is one of God's ways of preparing us and telling us, look for these things first, then we will know that that time, that season is upon us. Now again, dispensational theology was invented in the early 1800s. It was hatched out of the Brethren, which is a works-based salvation movement. They trust in their own works to get to heaven, not the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, also, it was carried forth by several Freemasons throughout different cults that preached a different Jesus and a different gospel. And we have it today as one of the most popular views of end point and end times theology and let's read second thessalonians chapter 2 one more time it says now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our lord jesus christ and by our gathering together unto him right the return of the lord and our gathering our rapture our resurrection that's verse one that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of christ is at hand the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ begins the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a term that covers a whole lot of stuff. The Bible does tell us that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and this day will last for greater than a thousand years. There's from the day that the Lord shows up, it's called the day of Christ, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the day of the Lord. Three and a half years of time, he's pouring out his wrath on the earth through the trumpets and the vials. Then... He comes back and sets up his throne on the earth. I believe New Jerusalem will descend upon the earth. Then for 1,000 years, there's peace on earth. Then Satan that was cast into hell for those 1,000 years is released, and he comes up for a little season. We're not told how long that season is, but the day of the Lord is 1,000 years plus that three and a half and plus that little season at the end. And all of that happens before the new heaven and the new earth. The ending of the day of the Lord is the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth. This earth will melt with a fervent heat. Hell will be brought forth and judged by God, and it will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So a second earth, or a second death, a new heaven, a new earth, all of that happens at the ending of of the day of the Lord. So, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you as fast as possible, and I know a lot of these uh, you may recognize and have sort of points, uh, but let's take uh, verse number three now, continuing. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, our, res our resurrection happens after the abomination of desolation. It happens after the mark of the beast. Verse 4 says he claims to be God, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitteth upon the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, why is this verse important? Because it destroys the pre-tribulation rapture narrative. It takes away from dispensational theology. It's basically saying that a false messiah will show up he will probably build a false temple. When this temple is built, most people will say, this is prophecy being fulfilled. 
And when people say that, they would be ignorant of the prophecies that Jesus has already fulfilled. Most people have a, a future Israel, a perspective to prophecy, instead of seeing Jesus fulfilling these things already completed in the past. There are only, the only proof verses that the uh, adamant, uh, real heady teachers of pre-tribulationalism pre -tribulationalism teach, they're actually vague, and the majority of the verses are teaching us to live right because at any moment we could stand before God. Now that part is true. Uh, your death is imminent. There's no promises from God. We're not promised tomorrow. You could die today. You could die while you're standing up here talking. God forbid, right? It could happen. And if so, then that was my last day and I'll have the regrets of what I didn't do with my time, right? And so there's the warning. Uh, the, all of the verses that they use are really telling you to get your life ready to live for God because you're going to meet God. And let me give you a sample of those. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, it says, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're waiting for Him, aren't we? But in no way does that say that we won't suffer tribulation. Philippians 3.20, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing, of course we look for Him. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for His Son from heaven. And these are just snippets. I'm pulling them out so you have an understanding. These are, these are the proof verses that the big name uh, teachers put out. To wait for His Son. Amen. I'm waiting for Him. Aren't you? Hey, if I die today, I'll, I'll get to meet him, right? Uh, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a hope that we have a blessing in that we can look forward to that hope. It is a glorious appearing, but it still doesn't teach a pre-trib rapture, does it? It doesn't by any means give you a timeline. Now, this is important because there are many verses that tell us things will happen first. Hebrews 9.28 is another one they use. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I've actually had a pre-tribber tell me, well, if you're not looking for the pre-trib, then you might not be resurrected. It's like, come on, buddy, really? Now we're really stretching these things here. Amen. We look for him. Christ is coming back. That is good news. However, there's prophecy yet to be fulfilled about a false Christ coming first, claiming to be the Christ, deceiving the whole world, uh, d uh, putting the whole world under his spell, this strong delusion. James 5, 7 says, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of our Lord. Amen. Again, not a, no pre-trib rapture in the verse. Jesus, in Revelation 22, he says, and behold, I come quickly. He says it more than once in that chapter. Behold, I come quickly. Amen. He does. He said that 2,000 years ago, and boy, he means it. When these things happen, they'll happen quickly, and in the six, 7,000 years history of earth, these past 2,000 years have just flown by. Doesn't time seem to be speeding up? Doesn't it? I mean, don't things seem to be happening faster and faster? It's really amazing. If you would, go to Revelation chapter 4. So, 2 Thessalonians 2, if anybody that is saved would ask the Holy Spirit for the truth of this, they would understand what it says holds true that we will see the Antichrist first, and after that, then we'll be resurrected, then we'll see the Lord. So that tribulation must come upon the earth, and Christians are appointed to tribulation, but thank God we are not appointed unto the wrath of the Lord. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, these are the verses that most pre-tribbers lean on. Revelation 4, verses 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter one. You're supposed to be in chapter four. I'm in chapter one. Please forgive me. Let me catch up with you. Uh, Revel that's the second time I did that today. All right, I did it in announcements as well. Revelation four, verse number one. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, 
And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He was caught up in the Spirit. This is John speaking. He's saying, heaven opens, I was called up, and immediately I was in the Spirit. Is this a bodily resurrection of all believers of all time? No, I'm sorry, it's just simply not in the text. He was literally having an out-of-body experience. The Bible talks about someone in a trance. Uh, what is it? It's uh, 2 Corinthians 12 where it talks about, Paul says, I was caught up to a third heaven. He saw spiritual things. He couldn't even tell us what they were, right? Some things he couldn't even be uttered. It was all in the spirit. So God caught up his spirit, said, let me show you some spiritual things. And he brought him back down. And, Paul, and John then wrote these spiritual things. This is the most prominently used verse as the basis for a pre-trib rapture, but it's simply not here in the text. Go to 1 Thessalonians 4 if you would. None of this teaches that Jesus can come back at any moment. The Bible is clear and it teaches it over and over that we will see trials and tribulations. And I've even spoken with other pastors. Interestingly enough, one pastor here in town, uh, we were at a, a preacher's fellowship, we're having lunch. He didn't know me from Adam. And uh, we're just sitting there having lunch. And he said, man, you know, with everything going on, it sure does make me think we're going to see some stuff before we get out of here. And he didn't know I was pre-wrath. I didn't agree with pre-trib. And I, amen, yes, sir. That's right. Amen, of course. Yeah, we're going to see some stuff before we get out of here. And I appreciate his honesty and not being afraid of just saying it and speaking up and saying, you know what, it sure seems like Christians are going to get persecuted while we're on the earth before we go to be with the Lord. And that is what the Bible tells us. You're in 1 Thessalonians 4. Look at verse number 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He says, don't be ignorant. Don't, uh, I want you to be knowledgeable about those that are passed on. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, right, that's salvation right there. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He says they're coming back. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For me, this is one of the strongest verses against this mixed up view of the pre-trib rapture because they end up there by saying the rapture is one event and the coming of the Lord is another event. But in this passage, in verse 15, it calls it the coming of the Lord and then it uses the word caught up in verse 17, which is where they get the word rapture. So you have a problem. At the coming of the Lord, we will be resurrected. And yes, of course, we'll be caught up, but these are not separate events. It's all one event. So I, I encourage you, underline coming of the Lord. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, the event that we rise is called the resurrection. I would encourage you to underline that as well. Verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You can underline caught up if you want, just so you know that is where they get the word rapture by converting the Greek word into Latin. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now we'll look at chapter 5. Well, he said, wait, where, Pastor Rufana, where's the comfort? He says in verse 13, sorrow not. He says in 18, comfort one. Well, what is it? Well, the Lord will come back, and when he comes back, it is the resurrection, and we will be with the Lord, and he will comfort us. So those that pass, they're not gone forever. They're not just gone forever. We will see them again one day, and perhaps one day soon. Now you're in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse number 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. A thief in the night. That was the name of a famous movie. That As a thief in the night. Well, of underlying day of the Lord. We have the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord. We will rise with him, the resurrection. That is the rapture. But the Bible calls it the coming of the Lord 
or the day of the Lord. That is the beginning of the end times. Uh, let's read the next couple verses here. After Thief in the Night, verse 3, it says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail on a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Now, here's the important phrase. The thief in the night, if a thief comes and steals your vehicle in the middle of the night, it would take you by surprise. You wake up and it's gone. That's actually happened to our family one time. Somebody came and took a vehicle. It's gone. We wake up. It's gone. What happened? It was in the middle of the night while we were sleeping. We didn't know, right? That's the thief in the night. But here he says, if you're saved, verse 4 that day should not overtake you as a thief. Why? You will see it coming. How? In all the signs of the Antichrist, the wars, the famines, the mark of the beast, the persecution. Verse 5, You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not the children of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So sleeping is compared to what the world is doing because they're ignorant of God. They're not filled with the Spirit. And he says, you need to watch. You need to pay attention. You need to be sober-minded. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are on, of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Look at verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, at the day of the Lord, when God begins to pour out His wrath, He has not appointed us unto wrath. We will not suffer that wrath. What a blessing from God. If you would, go to Galatians chapter 3. For the next few minutes, and I'll try to be brief, I want to give you the other hang-up, or the other objection, to the pre-wrath view. And that is asking the question, what role does Israel play in end times prophecy? Because Israel certainly does play a role. There will be a false messiah. He will stand up as king. He will be in a temple in Jerusalem proclaiming to be God. That much we know. That we will see before the resurrection. But the problem is dispensational theology, which is packaged with pre-tribulation rapture view, you're looking for Israel in a different light. Many people believe that the Israelites are saved by a different means, not by faith as we are, or that they're still blessed under the other covenant. In Revelation 2, there's a warning. It says, I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And listen, he says, and I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. He says, those that claim to be Jews, but they're not, he says, it is blasphemous to claim the name of God. Right? Just as Israel, I believe, is a representation of the name of Jesus, of the Son of God. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, well, wait a minute, what name is that? It's Israel. They were called by Israel. They're called by Jews. And what happened when a Jew got saved? What did they begin calling them? Christian. Christian. Aren't we called by Christ's name? We're given a new name. We're called by His name. And it would be blasphemous for somebody that worships the devil to claim to be Christian. Now, that's where the Catholic Church, full of blasphemy, right? Uh, we're told that there will be an abomination of desolation set up in Jerusalem. In Luke 21, it says, When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. These are events that we will recognize. And so Israel does play a part in the end times prophecy. But it's not what most dispensationalists think. Now, you're in Galatians 3, and again, I'll be brief. Give me just a couple more minutes of your time, and I hope that I make this clear and concise. I'm asking the Lord to make it clear to those that are hung up on this issue. So let's start by, in verse number 7. Know ye not, I'm sorry, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, when it says justify the heathen, it's talking about us. We're of another nation. We weren't raised in that lineage, that culture, that seed. We didn't have the oracles of God. We didn't have the 12 tribes. Now, I'm sure all of us share some of that blood, and there is no pure blood person on the earth. You have to understand, God is not a racist. 
God is not a respecter of persons. God does not look down and say, oh, I see that Israelite blood in your body. I have more respect for you, even though you don't have faith in Jesus. Think about how contrary that would be. This is what many people have believed. I talked to a lady earlier this week, and we talked about a number of different things. She ended up talking about church and everything else, and then she told me that she wanted to take her house and will it, give it in her her. Uh, her, when she passes, she wants to give it to an Israeli organization so that it can be a rapture safe house. After she's caught up, she wants to donate it to some uh, Jewish organization so that they can hide out in her house while the Antichrist is persecuting the world. And it just shows her bad doctrine. And, and it really is sad. They've really stolen the hearts of people and they believe Jewish fables and they don't understand the truth of the Scripture. Because in Galatians 3, he just said, we're saved by faith. We're children of Abraham by faith. And you guys know the song. Father Abraham. Who knows this song? Had many daughters. Many sons. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Many sons. He, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Why? Because God has saved us by faith. Praise God for that. It's not by my works of righteousness. It's the gift that He's given me. He's forgiven my sin. God is not a racist. He doesn't look at me and say, Oh, you're Irish. We don't save the Irish. He doesn't look at anybody based on their bloodline or their origin. Because I have to tell you, we all go back to Adam and Eve. Better than that, we all go back to Noah and his sons. We're all related. We have a common ancestor. But more important than that, we're saved by faith. We get the promises of Abraham. They come to us by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3, look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Look at verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. In Genesis 12, it, the promise is made unto Abraham, singular, and to his seed, singular, which is Jesus Christ. And because of the blessing of Jesus Christ, everyone in the world can be saved by faith. The promise is not one of preserving a, a nation. There were many people throughout the history of Israel that joined themselves. Uh, Esther, we see men became Jews for the fear of the Jews. They didn't change their bloodline. And they didn't change where they lived. They changed their faith in the one true living God. And by believing on Him, they were saved. And that's the good news. And it's always been the good news that salvation has always been by faith. And that blessing that was given to Abraham is the same blessing that you have today. God will protect you and he will pro provide for you. You are his children. In fact, go down to 26. I love this verse. Galatians 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Brother Chad, you are a son of God by your faith. You are a son of God. Naomi, you are a daughter of God by your faith. Do you understand? We are children of God by our faith. It's not by our works, thank God. Verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, wait a minute, what's that say? There is neither Jew nor Greek. When God looks down, He doesn't say, Well, this is a Jew that's believed. He's a Jewish Christian. He's Judeo-Christian. He's special. He's better. He's more elite. God does not operate like that. God does not say, well, you're, a, you're just a Greek Christian. Oh, well, you're an Irish Christian. You're an African Christian. You're an Asian Christian. No, sir. No, sir. In fact, if you're Jewish and you're not a Christian, but you're Asian and you are, God, will, God puts you in the family and you fall away because of your unbelief if you reject Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are heirs, we inherit eternal life. Go to Ephesians 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, not too far away. Look at verse number 11. Wherefore, 
Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands. So what's he saying? The group of people that circumcised their flesh have called you uncircumcised, verse 12, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. That means you were foreigners. You were not part of the nation. And strangers from the covenants of promise. In other words, not having eternal life. Having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You're brought in by the blood of Christ. Jump ahead to verse 19. Now therefore... Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You understand you are in the household of God, that it is all by faith, and once you're in, you are always in. If you would, go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll finish there. Uh, I'll read you briefly. In Romans chapter 2, it says something similar. Romans 2, verse 28, it says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. What's he saying? You are a Jew if you have believed in your heart, and God sees your heart, and when God praises you, when God sees it, He praises you. Being a Jew is not about getting the praise of men. I see your curly hair, and I see your funny outfit, and I see your hat. Therefore, I know that you're of this religion. Well, that's what man would say. But we can't glory in the flesh. It's not by appearance. We judge by the heart. Salvation is a matter of the heart. In Romans 9, he said, They are not all Israel which are of Israel. He says, Everybody in the flesh is not everybody that's in the Spirit. We are the children of God. We are His spiritual children. We've been adopted by our faith in Jesus Christ. And those that are in the physical nation of Israel that don't have Jesus Christ, they are not God's children. They are not God's chosen. You're in 1 Peter 2. Let's end with this. Look at verse number 5. 1 Peter 2, verse number 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now here he's quoting the Old Testament. He was talking to the Levites. You're a holy priesthood. You're a holy people. You're peculiar. You're set apart. We have a purpose for you. Jump ahead to verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation. Peter's writing to Christians. He says, you're the chosen people. He says, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. You know what makes us royal? Our father's a king. We are kings and priests. We serve with the Lord. You think about it. We're in the family. We'll serve with Him. What makes us a holy nation? Is it our own works? No, it's the works of Christ. We are a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And look at verse 10, last verse for tonight. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Hey, we've obtained mercy from our sins. And look, uh, the people that come together in this church, we come together under the name of Jesus Christ. We're saved by Jesus Christ. By faith in Him and His blood and His finished work, we are the people of God. We are God's chosen people and we come together because we have chosen Him. And listen, there are things that will happen in Israel, but there are no promises to a bloodline or a nation that rejects Jesus as their Savior. There is nothing there for them. If you read Galatians, or better yet, the book of Hebrews, he says, they fell away in the wilderness. They died. And guess what? Because of unbelief, they did not enter into the promised land. That's the picture of life here. For those that will not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will not see heaven, but the wrath of God 
abides on them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to defend the doctrine that there will be trials and tribulations before you return. Lord, I pray that you would begin to wake up our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. They're deceived by these lies. They've been put to sleep and told not to be ready and not to watch and not to be sober. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to be closer to you and gather and sow in all the more, so much the more as we see the day approaching. Lord, I thank you for showing us the truth. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live up to that name of being a royal people, a royal nation, a holy nation, a peculiar people, your chosen people for choosing you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for salvation. I pray you'd give us a blessed time of fellowship this afternoon. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.